Hello, my name is Amy Mansu, and I have the honor and privilege of being the CEO of Inspira Health. And today I am joined by our board members um, to be present for our community meeting. We're so grateful that you are here and look forward to providing you an update um, as required by law. Um, the next slide just talks about the summary of today's meeting. It identifies for you the specific law that I'm referencing. It's a New Jersey statute. Um, as well as moving forward on the agenda. Again, these are the key items that we think are most important for you to understand so we can fully brief you um, on Inspira and what our priorities are and what the challenges and opportunities are that we have before us. We'll start as we do most meetings with our mission to provide a safe and compassionate experience that improves the health and well being of our community by placing the safety of our patients and the support of our employees at the center of all we do. This mission was crafted with feedback from directly our stakeholders as well as our employees to really impact where we're headed. And the vision is that we inspire and empower healthier communities by creating the highest quality and most desirable patient experience in the region. We do all of this work uh, every single day uh, through our safety stories, really looking at how we remind ourselves um, how we keep ourselves safe and our community safe. This one is actually referencing something that's happened, which I know um, occurs and we all worry about, which is the issue of people taking advantage or scamming, if you will. And this one actually came directly through one of our local offices. Um, somebody called representing themselves um, as a Google ad person to be able to increase exposure from one of our uh, medical group offices. And there was just something, we call it within a high reliability organization, an organization that always is looking to make sure that something is going right or is there's a concern. There's something that just made this person concerned. And while they were excited about the opportunity to put us forward, they took a moment, we call them star moments. They stop, they think, they assess the situation and then move forward. And they checked in with one of their marketing experts. And sure enough, it turns out that the individual who had called in did not have a Google email address and actually was part of a nationwide scam where they were targeting healthcare facilities in order to try and access patient information. Not only did we not respond to this person, we reported them to the authorities, and we also shared this information with our other hospital colleagues in the community so they wouldn't be um, victimized. This is an opportunity that shows not only are we protecting ourselves, our patients, but as well um, our counterparts in the community. This is represented in all of the work we do through how we live, which is through our values. And the values came directly from feedback from our employees, really making sure that um, we were able to live into the work that we do. And so on the next slide, it talks about what those values are. The values are around innovation, compassion, reliability, empathy, access, teamwork, and empowerment. And our employees asked for two things. One, they wanted to see themselves very well focused. And that's why we started with the I. I not only stands for innovation, but it stands for the individual having impact, being able to lean into each of these values and be able to accomplish the mission and vision that we talked about. And the individuals have never been more important than right now during COVID. We certainly saw the critical nature of having our employees healthy, um, skilled and be able to respond to the tremendous things that have happened during those two years of our pandemic. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the tremendous work of every single Inspira employee and a special, of course, shout out um, to those frontline workers who gave so much. So I'd like to talk about our strategic plan, which uh, was adopted by our board of directors and uh, we are moving forward on. Our strategic plan has five components. Um, and those components, this is an eye chart, so I apologize. In the next slide, it looks like uh, not, you won't be able to read it, but we'll post it online for you. But I wanted to talk about just overall the domains. We really are focused on the quality and clinical excellence, making sure that we have the clinicians and the expertise within our community to be able to support you, that we are focused on your needs, on making sure that the patient is at the center of all we do. And we're looking at how to make sure we make that accessible and convenient that we really look at the issues of making sure that we have the right staff that are highly skilled to be able to be present um, to serve you and also to make sure that we have created the opportunities within our organization 
for our own employees to grow and gain new skills. And lastly, and one of the things we'll spend a lot of time talking about today is our community and the needs of our community and making sure that we are having programs that relate to um, the needs of the community and what they are telling us and really meeting the population's health, health needs of our community. Next, I'd like to talk to you about our patient stories. You know, I think our patient stories tell you how we treat people and, and what I've learned in my almost two years now here at Inspira with the privilege to serve you is that it is a very personal opportunity for us to care for people, not only to care for them from a health perspective, but to really look at the individual needs of our patients and really identify the opportunities to be able to support them in their goals. And so the first story talks about a very unique program in Violent that is supported by the county and um, it is the Monarch Family Success Center. And this is actually an opportunity for us to work directly um, with students as, they're, as they find themselves in, in challenging situations, often related to some teen pregnancy and also looking for support. And Anna Zamudo was one of those folks who really um, took every advantage of making sure that we were there to support her. She told us what her goals were, creating a healthy family environment, being able to have that stability. And so not, not only did we work with Anna um, at the um, at this Monarch Center when she was a volunteer, we also made sure that we provided the opportunity to connect her, connect her to those community resources where she actually was out able to get her own home. And she has become an invaluable resource for other community members. And we're so very fortunate to have people who are so engaged with us um, partnering with us to make sure that we can share our needs, not only the technical clinical skills, but that whole support, because we know that that's what's critically important to move forward. And then I want to share this, this great story about one of our patients, Chuck Pellegrini. Chuck uh, came into us with a, a very serious issue in reference to challenges about um, having struggles with being able to walk. He had a, a difficult issue with his ankle and he needed special treatment and he was in a lot of pain. And he, he finally came and got that treatment because he had one motivation. He wanted to dance with his daughter at the wedding. And so the entire team not only was worried about making sure that we had the clinical expertise to provide him, but it was also that emotional support that he was actually able to gain the strength and courage that this was possible, something he didn't know when he first came to us. And I think Dr. Tom McAndrew was able to elicit all of that because of the work that they did together, because of his trust in him, and really was able to move forward. And I'm thrilled to tell you that not only was he able to walk his uh, daughter down the aisle that they were able to have that first dance, which of course was to my girl by the temptations. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the, the big elephant in the room, which is what we've been facing for the last two years through this pandemic. We have um, had the opportunity through our tremendous uh, clinicians to create unique programs to help people who are finding themselves experience what we call long hauler syndrome with COVID. These are individuals who have come down with COVID, but they find themselves experiencing, once they're through that, that most critical period, challenges that they never expected. They find themselves short of breath. They find themselves with chronic headaches. They have an elevated heart rate, and they're just tired all the time. And so we have a, a program that was created, and honestly, it was created initially because we found our own employees were struggling with some of these things, and we wanted them to be able to get healed and get well. And from that, we were able to develop this and then share it with our broader community. So we have cardiology, we have pulmonology, um, we have physical medicine and rehab involved, we have neurology, we have a whole bunch of occupational health, speech health, speech therapy, as well um, as our physical therapy department, working with individuals to come up with unique plans to be able to do it. This program is developed in both Malika Hill and Vineland. And I can tell you that we have been able to treat people from um, significant distances outside of our county because it is so unique, such a unique program that combines all of the disciplines. And this is another example of how Inspira comes forward. We start as a small product with really trying to help our own employees and be able to care for them and then broaden that to the, the broader reach to make sure that we can provide these services and extend them to you. One of our other commitments, which has been so very important to us, is our teaching program. We have one of the largest teaching programs in the state of New Jersey in reference to providing residents um, to be able to do their training here. And our focus really has been not only providing that educational service, but doing what we all know is critically important. Our strategic plan showed us that 30%, 30% of our providers in Cumberland County are 
will have the opportunity if they choose to retire in the next five years. That creates a tremendous opportunity and requirement for us to step up. Doesn't mean that everybody has to be employed by Inspira, but it does mean that we have to be supporting our community physicians and help, helping them um, gain other doctors to join their practices as well as grow our own medical group. And through the process, we've identified that there's a real opportunity within our own residents to, to help us help our community by staying here, by falling in love with South Jersey. And so we really have begun our focus, not only on the training, but on how we retain those individuals to stay here. And um, our Vineland program has 169 slots that access over 11 areas of specialties. And when I say slots, that means that there are opportunities for individual physicians to say that they wanna come train here and then have the opportunity to train with us. The Mullica Hill program is brand new. When we opened Mullica Hill, we received our first class last year. And I'm thrilled to tell you that we currently have 98 opportunities to do training. And we believe that that will continue to grow as we move forward in, um, in working with the federal government to identify these opportunities. And I'm really, really proud to tell you that we actually created um, a psychiatry residency in partnership with Rowan University, which has been, um, we know, one of the greatest learnings out of COVID was the need for behavioral health and mental health programs. This year, we've really focused on physician recruitment out of those classes, identifying unique programs that we could um, incent our uh, doctors to remain here, whether it be through an early um, assignment of a contract to work with us as after they get done their residency um, in their third year, or whether or not it's looking for loan forgiveness or other opportunities. And even there in that situation, we find that what we really need is the support of the community. Um, being welcomed into a community and making sure that we create those opportunities for you to meet these new positions, whether it be locally on your street, whether they buy a house here, or whether it be in a broader circumstance as one of your pro potential providers, is something that we will be very focused on as we continue to move forward and that we are very proud of that we have that opportunity to do. Secondly, I want to talk to you about it, just a wonderful opportunity that has been developed with Inspira and one of our strong community partners in both Cumberland Community and Cumberland and Gloucester counties, the Rowan College of South Jersey. Dr. Fred Keating, their president, came to me a few months after I started and said, you know, I think there's an opportunity for us to do more. And out of that graciousness on his part to really look at that, we have created an amazing program for our employees that will allow any Inspira employee to go back to school for half price at Rowan College of South Jersey. When you combine that with the tuition reimbursement program that we have offered, um, it will provide almost a full opportunity to gain that education. And since we launched this program in May, we have already seen um, many people sign up and begin their curriculum in July. Today, as I was, I happened to be in Mullica Hill today, as I was walking through the hall, I met a young woman who's a new um, orientee uh, in our nursing program. And she has been a clerk with us. And it is an example of what we hope to and aspire to create for every one of our employees is they may enter in one position, but if they have the desire, um, we will partner with them to make sure that they can go back to school and fulfill their dreams. In this case, uh, her dream was to be a nurse, and I'm so thrilled to see her on orientation, although I think it was day three and she was a little nervous, um, but it, it does talk about the importance and the opportunity. And so if any of this um, sounds like it's, it would be of interest to you, we would welcome you to go to our website, check, I have to do a plug, sorry, um, to check the jobs that are open and um, see if anything can start. And believe me, that first job doesn't mean it's your last job, it's just your first job in. And we want to be not only your healthcare provider for life, but your, your employer for your entirety of your career. And that really is this wonderful opportunity that Rowan has given us. We know that it's going to be a great opportunity for employees. And I hope that there'll be people from the community that will continue to come and make Inspira their home. All of this happens because we've made a $2 million commitment to create programming. Um, with the university. It also will be providing, the tuition applies to any existing program, but we know that there are new programs that need to be developed. And so as we continue to identify need, Rowan has, um, College of South Jersey has committed to be with us in that process. And because Rowan College of South Jersey has such a unique uh, opportunity with Rowan University to then go on to get that four-year degree, we know it's a win all the way around. And we're very, very um, grateful for Dr. Keating, for his leadership, and of course, for the entire team um, at uh, the Rowan College of South Jersey to really do the work that they've done 
I will just tell a quick story. Dr. Susan Hall is the um, leader at the, the College of Nursing at Rowan. Um, Dr. Hall was also one of our nurses uh, back in the day in Underwood. And during COVID, she not only worked with her nursing students to provide the support for them, but she also stepped forward and, uh, and took shifts herself. And I think that shows the commitment that she has to not only her own students, um, but to our community, because she knew um, that we were so in need of, of extra sets of hands, and especially somebody that had the expertise that she did. So next, I want to talk about actually um, the, our community benefit. There is a federal requirement that every hospital every three years must do a, a review. Um, they must engage stakeholders, they must interview the public, they must talk to their own um, board members and uh, broader community leaders. They do that through, uh, we do that through the Walter Rand Institute. And I'm very thrilled to tell you that we have um, completed that, that analysis for this year. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But these numbers show you the, the commitments that we've made um, over the last three years of investment. These are dollars that have come from the hospital, that have invested in the community to support the needs that have been identified in our community health needs assessment. So you'll see each year they have gone up. The 21 number is preliminary because we have not finished our final audit yet, but it's, a, it's you know, we're getting very close to that $80 million investment. And I think it demonstrates the commitment that we have to really um, determining with you what the needs are, not just what the hospital's needs are, but what the community's needs are, and really has helped us um, find those linkages to really try and meet that community need. As we look at the uh, uh, needs that were identified in the last the next community health needs assessment, which just finished last year, and that we have beginning to implement, um, there were five priorities that came out. Clearly, COVID-19 was the largest priority and, and concern that most people had. How do we recover, not just from a health perspective, but economically? How do we make sure that we can um, go back to whatever the, that normal looks like as we move forward? And I think that that's an evolutionary process for all of us. And you'll talk. I'll talk about that as we talk about the number of people that we were able to care for and some of the work that we did. Mental health and behavioral health came out as a number two issue right behind COVID. And most things are directly, directly correlated. We know that the isolation that people felt um, was absolutely significant. And some of the work that we're seeing in children that um, the National Children's Hospital Association has begun to put together showed us that every child actually would be diagnosed at this point with an adverse childhood event because of that isolation. Some kids deal with it differently than others, but the reality is that that support and the focus on making sure that we can remove the stigmas around mental health and get people the access to services they need is so very important. When I was with one of our physicians this morning, she said to me, yesterday she had the privilege of taking care of almost 60 people. And as she looked at their day at the end of the day, almost all of those individuals were on anxiety or some type of antidepressant. That is a shocking number to think about when you think about our communities being in that kind of need. And it's hard to understand that, but the reality is we have been through a very difficult time. And I know we are all anxious to put that behind us, but we also must make sure that we're supporting people in that effort. The accessibility and the availability and affordability of care showed up over and over again in our survey. I have to tell you, as somebody who's worked um, in, in, uh, in healthcare and tried to be active in supporting the expansion of healthcare insurance, it's really just disheartening in some ways to see that this continues to show up. But it's a reminder to us that no matter how much work has been done, none of those programs matter if we can't link people to those programs. And so as we continue to move forward, that's going to be a focus in working with our stakeholders in the community to really identify what are the things that we can do together on making sure people know the programs that exist out there and make sure that they're actually enrolled in them. The access to children's health care. And again, that was very closely correlated to the mental health and behavioral health. The access for kids to get the behavioral health care they need, the um, support of all of those programs, and really making sure that um, they know how to access the programs, again, that are available to them. You've heard about the program that we support um, within the violent community, but we know that there are more children that need that early access and easy access. And so we will continue to focus with the stakeholders on that. And lastly, food and diet. We know that children can't learn, that people can't work. If you don't have access to absolutely those basics, food, water, shelter. 
That is one of the fundamentals and it continues to show up over and over again. And as I begin to talk about some of the investments we've made, you will see that they are directly correlated to the priorities I've just laid out. So our plan as we move forward is to really look at, continue our efforts to make sure that we're meeting the needs in reference to whatever COVID brings next. We're hoping that because so many individuals have been vaccinated already and so many individuals have had COVID, that the spread this fall is not gonna be nearly as devastating in reference to requiring hospitalization as it has been in the past. But the reality is we don't know what a new variant could bring. We don't know how much um, we'll be able to anticipate with a new booster, which is what I understand is being talked about. Um, one of our experts, Dr. Green, uh, said to me today, we're hopeful that it's gonna be arriving in September, but we don't know when. And we hope that we can get ahead of that variant before people start to get hospitalized again. Mental health and behavioral health. One of the things that we see that's a result of having dealing coping with some of those mental health and behavioral health needs is a significant rise in addiction, both in drug and alcohol. So the need to make sure that we're supporting programs and uh, supporting those individuals that are working in, in these areas is critical. Again, as I mentioned, the affordability of care, reducing barriers to receiving those care and making sure we're partnering with government programs to make sure our patients know what's available and that we're partnering to make sure that we can get those. Improving the health and well-being of our children. There probably is no greater responsibility for any of us as both healthcare providers, as community members, is to make sure we're creating that environment for our children to thrive and flourish. And lastly, food and diet, making sure we continue to look at the issue around promoting healthy eating and making nutritious foods available. We know obesity continues to be the number one issue that then lends itself to other conditions such as heart disease. And so really focusing our attention on making sure we're having those difficult conversations and creating the opportunities for people to be healthier are all part of the work that we're doing. And so you say to me, Amy, how do we do that? We do it through the distribution of our and support of our local communities, whether it be the Terra Pouches or Narcon. Narcan obviously deals with people who are in crisis and literally trying to save their lives. But the Terra Pouches provide the opportunity, which we've committed and supported um, in our community to take those drugs out of your um, bathrooms that you're not using, put them in the pouches and return them to the police so we can indeed get those off the street because we know that those are gateway drugs to be able to move forward. Our wonderful partnership with um, in Cumberland County, I'm sorry, um, the access to food. We have provided the food pantries more than 140,000 pounds of food across 3,200 families. And our food pharmacies where we identify food as an issue where people can come right in um, have provided over 50 patients access to free nutrition and services and grocery items real time. Um, our Cumberland County Housing First program, this is the opportunity that we've partnered um, with the M25 program and our uh, behavioral health employees have actually built homes and we were so proud to be uh, on site for the 100th um, house that was created for a um, individual who had previously been homeless to be able to live permanently. We know that is part of the food water shelter, making sure that we can be able to support those initiatives and, and Housing First gives us that opportunity to, to fund those. And we are so proud that we've committed over a quarter of a million dollars to that process. So I'm running out of time and I'm gonna run through some quick slides. Um, our, we'd be able to talk about our vaccines. Obviously many of you received your vaccines from Inspira. We gave out over 141,000 vaccines. We also, if you talk about the next slide, we've also provided um, 150, almost over 2,300 um, infusion services. So these are folks who have come to us after they've had COVID within that first five days and be able to have that infusion to make sure that that process was less than it could have been and, uh, and they healed faster. So here are some quick statistics. And again, our deck will be on the, um, on the website for you to see but we were very, very busy during COVID. 30,000 admissions, 3,100 births, 160,000 people seen in our emergency rooms. And of course you can see that all of this was done um, through our medical staff, through our volunteers and through our employees. And for that, we were very critical. You know, these meetings started because a hospital in Bergen County um, ran into financial trouble. And a legislator said, I had no idea that they were in trouble. And so there has to be a way for the community to know each year what's going on. And so here we present our financials. And when you look at this, you say, wow, they had a great year. You should be really, really proud of, of all the work you've done that you have this money that you can then invest in all the things I talked about. But it's probably important for me to note transparently that 
two pieces of this money, $20 million was given through our earned through our shared savings program with our largest insurer. So that's a one-time money that's not gonna come through again. And in addition, $24 million came just because of the volume in COVID. So when you look at that money, that's not counted on as we move forward. And we're certainly seeing, because 2022 has presented new challenges. You know nationally that there was a huge demand for nursing. And so really making sure that we could meet those salaries was a requirement that we had in 2022. Our supply costs, our pharmacy costs, just like for all of you have gone up. And right now we are um, running at a deficit. And so we are hopeful that we'll be able to um, begin to continue to make those investments. But I also wanted to just point out to you, where does some of this money go? In a for-profit company, you share it with shareholders. In a non-profit company, we invest it back into our organization. And so if you look at the next slide, what we really are talking about is some of those examples. You know that um, we have a plan in the, um, on the pipeline to have a redevelopment project in Woodbury. We are committing $52 million to build um, a, sat a satellite emergency department, as well as to move our behavioral health program that is currently at Woodbury to do that. And you will begin to see the gates going up and some construction going down. We are also working with developers to identify what will be done in the larger piece of that land. And we're excited and hopeful that we'll be able to uh, share more with that over the coming weeks and months. We have our beautiful new GI center in Vineland. We have our new center in Williamstown, which we're just waiting licensing for. Um, and our Deptford Health Center, which again, you'll see is the old Dix, which is right behind the um, Lone Star Steakhouse. And um, you see a construction there that has been completely gutted and we're very excited to put our primary care, our cardiac program and um, our uh, rehab program, cardiac rehab program in there as well, as well as some other physician offices. That all totals almost $100 million that we will be investing in the community. And so it shows you that we are making those investments strategically to be able to best support you. So in the final time, I'll ask Megan Elaine, who is supporting me on the computer today, whether or not there are any questions from the community that um, I, should, I can answer. No questions have come through yet, Amy. Okay. Um, you have a, in the chat box uh, on there, you'll see the, the uh, email address. So if there aren't questions now, but you think of them later, we really would appreciate the opportunity to, to respond to them. And please feel free to use that email address. I just want to close um, by thanking the board of directors who have given so much of their time and supporting our um, 7,800 employees, 6,800 employees um, through all of these very difficult times. I want to thank the senior team and all the employees at Inspira. But mostly we want to thank you. You have been tremendous supporters of us over these last two years. You have been there for our staff. You have given us your time, your energy. You've been patient with us as we've navigated this journey. And we're thankful. We take our relationship with you very, very seriously. And um, we indeed are grateful for all the things that we're doing. Now I'm getting the sign that there's a question up. Okay, thank with, you. With two minutes left to spare, are there any updates on the Salem Medical Center and Inspira merger? Thank you so much for that. Um, we have entered into an agreement to um, work with the Salem Medical Center to come to closure um, on the deal that we're hoping will come forward. We have a public hearing on the 10th of August and those details I will ask them to put in the chat so you know when they were. I believe, I know the time is between 11 and one but the location has lost me at this point. Salem Community College. Salem Community College, thank you. Um, and you can sign up to, to speak if you have any interest in doing so. Um, following that public hearing process, we will finalize the um, opportunity with our with CHA, um, who is the current owner of Salem, and then the Attorney General of the Department of Health have a review process that will take up to 90 days, but could happen sooner. So certainly within the either the end of this quarter or the beginning of next, we're hoping to have final answers on that. Any other good prompts from the community that I didn't get to answer that I no other questions. Could you just repeat the date of the public hearing so that I can type it in accurately? Sure. The public hearing is set for August 10th at 11 a.m. And it's set at the community, uh, Salem Community College. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, our gratitude for you signing in today and our gratitude to our boards and directors for your tremendous volunteerism and for all of your support. Thank you very much.